Books on Tape presents A Storm of Swords Book 3 of A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin Read by Roy Detrice Prologue The day was grey and bitter cold, and the dogs would not take the scent. The big black bitch had taken one sniff at the bear tracks, backed off, and skulked back to the pack with her tail between her legs. The dogs huddled together miserably on the river bank as the wind snapped at them. Chet felt it too, biting through his layers of black wool and boiled leather. It was too bloody cold for man or beast, but here they were. His mouth twisted, and he could almost feel the boils that covered his cheeks and neck growing red and angry. I should be safe back at the wall, tending the bloody ravens, and making fires for old Maester Eamon. It was the bastard John Snow who had taken that from him, him and his fat friend Sam Tarley. It was their fault he was here, freezing his bloody balls off with a pack of hounds deep in the haunted forest. Seven elves. He gave the leashes a hard gank to get the dog's attention. Track, you bastards! That's a bear print! You want some meat or no? Find! But the hounds only huddled closer, whining. Chet snapped his short lash above their heads, and the black bitch snarled at him. Dog meat would taste as good as bear, he warned her, his breath frosting with every word. Lark, the sister man, stood with his arms crossed over his chest and his hands tucked up into his armpits. He wore black wool gloves, but he was always complaining how his fingers were frozen. It's too bloody cold, don't, he said. Bugger this bear is not worth freezing over. We can't go back empty hand, Lark, rumbled small paw through the brown whiskers that covered most of his face. The Lord Commander wouldn't like that. There was ice under the big man's squash pug nose where his snot had frozen. A huge hand in a thick fur glove clenched tight around the shaft of a spear. Bugger that old bear, too, said the sister man, a thin man with sharp features and nervous eyes. Mormont will be dead before daybreak, remember? Who cares what he likes? Small Paul blinked his black little eyes. Maybe he had forgotten, Chet thought. He was stupid enough to forget almost anything. Why do we have to kill the old bear? Why don't we just go off and let him be? You think he'd let us be, said Lark. He'll hunt us down. You want to be hunted, you great muttonhead? No, said Small Paul. I don't want that. I don't. So you'll kill him, said Lark. Yes, the huge man stamped the butt of his spear on the frozen river bank. I will. He shouldn't hunt us. The sister man took his hands from his armpits and turned to Chet. We need to kill all the officers, I see. Chet was sick of hearing it. We've been over this. The old bear dies and blamed from the shadow tower. Grubs and Aethon as well. They're ill luck for drawing the watch. Darwin and Bannon for their tracking, and Sir Piggy for the ravens. That's all. We kill them quiet while they sleep. One scream and we're worm food, every one of us. His boils were red with rage. Just do your bit and see that your cousins do theirs. And Paul, try and remember it's third watch, not second. Third watch, the big man said through hair and frozen snot. Me and Softfoot. I remember, chat. The moon would be black tonight, and they had jiggered the watches so as to have eight of their own standing sentry, with two more guarding the horses. It wasn't going to get much riper than that. Besides, the wildlings could be upon them any day now. Chet meant to be well away from here before that happened. He meant to live. Three hundred sworn brothers of the Night's Watch had ridden north, two hundred from Castle Black, and another hundred from the Shadow Tower. 
It was the biggest ranging in living memory, near to a third of the watch's strength. They meant to find Ben Stark, Sir Waymar Royce, and the other rangers who'd gone missing, and discover why the wildlings were leaving their villages. Well, they were no closer to Stark and Royce than when they'd left the wall, but they'd learn where all the wildlings had gone, up into the icy heights of the godforsaken Frostfangs. They could squat up there till the end of time, and it wouldn't prick Chet's boils none. But no, they were coming down, down the milk water. Chet raised his eyes, and there it was. The river's stony banks were bearded by ice, its pale, milky waters flowing endlessly down out of the frost fangs. And now Mance Raider and his wildlings were flowing down the same way. Thorin Smallwood had returned in a ladder three days past. While he was telling the old bear what his scouts had seen, his man, Kedge White-Eye, told the rest of them. They're still well up the foothills, but they're coming, Kedge said, warming his hands over the fire. Harma, the dog's head, has a van, the poxy bitch. Gody crept up on her camp and saw her playing by the fire. That fool, Dumblejohn, wanted to pick her off with an arrow, but Smallwood had better sense. Chet spat. How many were there, could you tell? Oh, many and more. Twenty, thirty thousand. We didn't stay to count. Armour had five hundred in the van, every one a horse. The men around the fire exchanged uneasy looks. It was a rare thing to find even a dozen mounted wildlings. And five hundred? Smallwood sent Bannon and me wide round the van to catch a peek at the main body, Kedge went on. There was no end of them. They're moving slow as a frozen river, four, five miles a day, but they don't look like they mean to go back to their villages neither. More than half were women and children, and they were driving their animals before them, goat, sheep, even oryx dragging sledges. They'd loaded up with bales of fur and sides of meat, cages of chickens, butter churns and spinning wheels, every damn thing they own. The mules and garrons were so heavy laden, you think their backs would break. The women as well. And they follow the milk water, Lark the sister man asked. I said so, didn't I? The milk water would take them past the fist of the first men, the ancient ring fort where the night's watch had made its camp. Any man with a thimble of sense could see that it was time to pull up stakes and fall back on the wall. The old bear had strengthened the fist with spikes and pits and caltrops, but against such a host all that was pointless. If they stayed here, they would be engulfed and overwhelmed. And Thorin Smallwood wanted to attack. Sweet Donald Hill was squire to Sir Malador Lock, and the night before last Smallwood had come to Locke's tent. Sir Malador had been of the same mind as old Sir Utton Withers, urging a retreat on the wall, but Smallwood wanted to convince him otherwise. This king beyond the wall will never look for so far north, Sweet Donald reported him saying, and this great host of his is a shambling horde, full of useless mouths who won't know what end of a sword to hold. One blow will take all the fight out of them and send them howling back to their hovels for another fifty years. Three hundred against thirty thousand. Chet called that rank madness. And what was madder still was that Sir Malador had been persuaded, and the two of them together were on the point of persuading the old bear. If we wait too long, this chance may, may be lost. Never to come again, Smallwood was saying to anyone who would listen. Against that, Sir Otten Withers said, We are the shield that guards the realms of men. You do not throw away your shield for no good purpose. But to that, Thorin Smallwood said, In a sword for far fight, a man's surest defense is a swift stroke 
that slays his foe, not cringing behind a, uh, a shield. Neither Smallwood nor Withers had the commander. Lord Mormont did, and Mormont was waiting for his other scouts, for Jarman Buckwell and the men who had climbed the giant stair, and for Corrin Halfhand and John Snow, who had gone to probe the Skirling Pass. Buckwell and the Halfhand were late in returning, though. Dead, most like. Chet pictured Jon Snow lying blue and frozen on some bleak mountaintop with a wildling spear of his bastard ass. The thought made him smile. I hope they killed his bloody wolf as well. There's no bear here, he decided abruptly. Just an old print, that's all. Back to the fist. The dogs almost yanked him off his feet, as eager to get back as he was. Maybe they thought they were going to get fed. Chet had to laugh. He hadn't fed them for three days now to turn them mean and hungry. Tonight, before slipping off into the dark, he'd turn them loose among the horse lines after sweet Donald Hill and Clubfoot Carl cut the tethers. They'll have snarling hounds and panicked horses all over the fist, running through fires, jumping the ring wall, and trampling down tents. With all the confusion, it might be hours before anyone noticed that fourteen brothers were missing. Lark had wanted to bring in twice that number, but what could you expect from some stupid fish-breath sister man? Whisper a word in the wrong ear, and before you knew it, you'd be short ahead. No, fourteen was a good number, enough to do what needed doing, but not so many that they couldn't keep the secret. Chet had recruited most of them himself. Small Paul was one of his, the strongest man on the wall, even if he was slower than a dead snail. He'd once broken a wildling's back with a hug. They had Dirk as well, named for his favorite weapon, and the little gray man the brothers called Softfoot, who'd raped a hundred women in his youth, and liked to boast how none had never seen nor heard him until he shoved it up inside them. The plan was Chet's. He was the clever one. He'd been steward to old Maester Amon for four good years before that bastard Jon Snow had done him out, so his job could be handed to that fat pig of a friend. When he killed Sam Tarly tonight, he planned to whisper, Give my love to Lord Snow, right in his ear before he sliced the piggy's throat open to let the blood come bubbling out through all those layers of suet. Chet knew the ravens, so he wouldn't have no trouble there, no more than he would with Tarly. One touch of the knife, and that craven would piss his pants and start blubbering for his life. Let him beg. It won't do him no good. After he'd opened his throat, he'd open the cages and shoo the birds away, so no messages reached the wall. Softfoot and Small Paul would kill the old bear, Dirk would do Blaine, and Lark and his cousins would silence Bannon and old Dywin to keep them from sniffing after their trail. They'd been caching food for a fortnight, and Sweet Donald and Clubfoot Carl would have the horses ready. With Mormont dead, command would pass to Sir Utton Withers, an old Don man, and failing. He'd be running for the wall before sundown, and he won't waste no men sending them after us neither. The dogs pulled at him as they made their way through the trees. Chet could see the fist punching its way up through the green. The day was so dark that the old bear had the torches lit, a great circle of them burning all along the ring wall that crowned the top of the steep stony hill. The three of them waded across a brook. The water was icy cold, and patches of ice were spreading across its surface. I'm going to make for the coast, Lark the sister man confided. Me and my cousins will build us a boat, sail back home to the sisters. And at home they'll know you for deserters and lop off your fool heads, thought Chet. There was no leaving the night's watch, once you said your words. Anywhere in the Seven Kingdoms they'd take you and kill you. Follow Lophan now. He was talking about sailing back to Tyrosh, 
where he claimed men didn't lose their heads for a bit of honest thievery, nor get sent off to freeze their life away for being found in bed with some knight's wife. Chet had Wade going with him, but he didn't speak their wet, girly tongue, and what could he do in Tyrosh? He had no trade to speak of, growing up in Hagsmire. His father had spent his life grubbing in other men's fields and collecting leeches. He'd strip down bare but for a thick leather clout and go wading in the murky waters. When he climbed out, he'd be covered from nipple to ankle. Sometimes he made Chet help pull the leeches off. One had attached itself to his palm once, and he'd smashed it against a wall in revulsion. His father beat him bloody for that. The maesters bought the leeches at twelve for a penny. Lark could go home if he liked, and that damned Tyrushi too, but not yet. If he never saw Hagsmire again, it would be too bloody soon. He had liked the look of Craster's keep himself. Craster lived high as a lord there, so why shouldn't he do the same? That would be a laugh. Chet, the leechman's son, a lord with a keep. His banner could be a dozen leeches on a field of pink. But why stop at lord? Maybe he should be a king. Man's raider started out as a crow. I could be a king, same as him, and have me some wives. Craster had nineteen, not even counting the young ones, the daughters he hadn't gotten around to bedding yet. Half them wives were as old and ugly as Craster, but that didn't matter. The old ones Chet could put to work, cooking and cleaning for him, pulling carrots and slopping pigs, while the young ones warmed his bed and bore his children. Craster wouldn't object. Not one small paw gave him a hug. The only women Chet had ever known were the whores he'd bought in Molestown. When he'd been younger, the village girls took one look at his face with its boils and its when, and turned away sickened. The worst was that slattern Besser. She'd spread her legs for every boy in Hagsmire, so he figured, why not him too? He even spent a morning picking wildflowers when he heard she liked them. But she'd just laughed in his face and told him she'd crawl in a bed with his father's leeches before she'd crawl in one with him. She stopped laughing when he put his knife in her. That was sweet, the look on her face. So he pulled the knife out and put it in her again. When they caught him down their seven streams, old Lord Walder Frey hadn't even bothered to come himself to do the judging. He'd sent one of his bastards, that Walder Rivers, and the next thing Chet had known, he was walking to the wall with that foul-smelling black devil Yoren, to pay for his one sweet moment they took his whole life. But now he meant to take it back, and Craster's women too. That twisted old wilding has the right of it. If you want a woman to wife, you take her, and none of this giving her flowers so that maybe she don't notice your bloody boils. Chet didn't mean to make that mistake again. It would work, he promised himself for the hundredth time, so long as we get away clean. Sir Artin would strike south for the Shadow Tower, the shortest way to the wall. He won't bother with us, not with us. All he'll want is to get back whole. Thorin Smallwood now. He'd want to press on with the attack, but Sir Artin's caution ran too deep, and he was senior. It won't matter any how. Once we're gone, Smallwood can attack anyone he likes. What do we care? If none of them ever returns to the wall, no one will ever come looking for us. He'll think we died with the rest. That was a new thought, and for a moment it tempted him. But they would need to kill Sir Utten and Sir Malador Locke as well, to give Smallwood the command, and both of them were well attended day and night. No, the risk was too great. Chet, said Smallpaw, as they trudged along a stony game trail through sentinels and soldier pines, what about the bird? What bloody bird? The last thing he needed now was some muttonhead going on about a bird. 
The old bear's raven, Small Paul said. If we kill him, who's going to feed his bird? Who bloody what cares? Kill a bird too, if you like. I don't want to kill no bird, the big man said. But that's a talking bird. What if it tells what we did? Lark, the sister man, laughed. Small Paul, thick as a castle wall, he mocked. You shut up with that said Small Paul dangerously. Paul, said Chet, before the big man got too angry, when they find the old man lying in a pool of blood with his throat slit, they won't need no bird to tell them someone killed him. Small Paul chewed on that a moment. That's true, he allowed. Can I keep the bird, then? I like that bird. He's yours, said Chet just to shut him up. We can always eat him if we get hungry, offered Lark. Small Paul clouded up again. Best not try and eat my bird, Lark. Best not. Chet could hear voices drifting through the trees. Close your bloody mouths, both of you. We're almost to the fist. They emerged near the west face of the hill and walked around south, where the slope was gentler. Near the edge of the forest, a dozen men were taking archery practice. They had carved outlines on the trunks of trees and were loosing shafts at them. Look, said Lark, a pig with a bow. Sure enough, the nearest bowman was Sir Piggy himself, the fat boy who had stolen his place with Maester Amon. Just the sight of Samuel Tarley filled him with anger. Stewarding for Maester Amon, had been as good a life as he'd ever known. The old blind man was undemanding, and Clydus had taken care of most of his wants anyway. Chet's duties were easy. Cleaning the rookery, a few fires to build, a few meals to fetch. And Amon never once hit him. Thinks he can just walk in and shove me out on account of being eye-born and knowing how to read. Might be I'll ask him to read my knife before I open his soap with it. You go on, he told the others. I want to watch this. The dogs were pulling, anxious to go with them, to the food they thought would be waiting at the top. Chet kicked the bitch with the toe of his boot, and that settled them down some. He watched from the trees as the fat boy wrestled with the long bow as tall as he was, his red moon face screwed up with concentration. Three arrows stood in the ground before him. Tarly knocked and drew, held the draw a long moment as he tried to aim and let fly. The shaft vanished into the greenery. Chet laughed loudly, a snort of sweet disgust. Core will never find that one, and I'll be blamed, announced Ed Tollett the dark, grey-headed squire everyone called Dolorous Ed. Call nothing ever goes missing that they don't look at me. Ever since that time I lost my horse, eh? As if that could be helped. He was white and it was snowing, eh? What did they expect? The wind took that one, said Gren, another friend of Lord Snow's. Try to hold the bow steady, Sam. That's heavy. The fat boy complained, but he pulled the second arrow all the same. This one went high, sailing through the branches ten feet above the target. Oh, I believe you knocked a leaf off that tree, said Dolorous Ed. Fall is falling fast enough, eh? There's no need to help it, <laughs> he sighed. And we all know what follows fall, eh? God, but I'm cold. Oh, shoot the last arrow, Samuel. I believe my tongue is freezing to the roof of my mouth, eh? So Piggy lowered the bow, and Chet thought he was going to start bawling. That's too hard. Notch, draw, and loose, said Gren. Go on. Dutifully, the fat boy plucked his final arrow from the earth, notched it to his long bow, drew, and released. He did it quickly without squinting along the shaft, painstakingly, as he had the first two times. 
The arrow struck the charcoal outline low in the chest and hung quivering. I hit him, Sir Piggy sounded shocked. Gran, did you see? Ed, look, I hit him. Put it between his ribs, I'd say, said Gren. Did I kill him? the fat boy wanted to know. Tullet shrugged. Might have punctured a lung if he had a lung. Most trees don't as a rule, eh? He took the bow from Sam's hand. Oh, I've seen worse shots, though. I oh, and made a few. Sir Piggy was beaming. To look at him, you think he'd actually done something. But when he saw Chet and the dogs, his smile curled up and died squeaking. You it a tree, Chet said. Let's see how you shoot when it's Mance Raider's lads. They won't stand there with their arms out and their leaves rustling. Oh, no, they'll come right at you, screaming in your face, and I bet you'll piss those britches. One of them will plant his axe right between those little pig eyes. The last thing you'll hear will be the thunk it makes when it bites into your skull. The fat boy was shaking. Dolores Ed put a hand on his shoulder. Brother, he said solemnly, just because it happened that way for you doesn't mean Samwell will suffer the same, eh? What are you talking about, Tullet? Call that axe that split your skull, eh? Is it true that half your wits leaked out on the ground and your dogs ate them, eh? The big lout Gren laughed, and even Samuel Tarley managed a weak little smile. Chet kicked the nearest dog, yanked on their leashes, and started up the hill. Smile all you want, Sir Piggy. We'll see you last tonight. He only wished he had time to kill Tullard as well. Gloomy, horse-faced fool. That's what he is. The climb was steep, even on this side of the fist, which had the gentler slope. Part way up, the dog started barking and pulling at him, figuring that they'd get fed soon. He gave them a taste of his boot instead, and a crack of the whip for the big ugly one that snapped at him. Once they were tied up, he went to report. The prints were there like giants said, but the dogs wouldn't track he told Mormont, in front of his big black tent. Down by the river like that could be old prince. Here, yeah, pity, Lord Commander Mormont had a bald head and a great shaggy grey beard and sounded as tired as he looked. We might all have been better for a bit of fresh meat. The raven on his shoulder bobbed its head and echoed, Meat! 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 We could cook the bloody dogs, Chet thought, but he kept his mouth shut until the old bear sent him on his way. And that's the last time I'll need to bow my head to that one, he thought to himself with satisfaction. It seemed to him that it was growing even colder, which he would have sworn wasn't possible. The dogs huddled together miserably in the hard, frozen mud, and Chet was half tempted to crawl in with them. Instead, he wrapped a black wool scarf around the lower part of his face, leaving a slit for his mouth between the wines. It was warmer if he kept moving, he found, so he made a slow circuit of the perimeter with a wad of sour leaf, sharing a chew or two with the black brothers on guard and hearing what they had to say. None of the men on the day watch were part of his scheme. Even so, he figured it was good to have some sense of what they were thinking. Mostly what they were thinking was that it was bloody cold. The wind was rising as the shadows lengthened. It made a high, thin sound as it shivered through the stones of the ring wall. I hate that sound, little giant said. It sounds like a babe in the brush wailing away for milk. When he finished the circuit, and returned to the dogs, he found Lark waiting for him. The officers are in the old bear's tent again, talking something fierce. That's what they do, said Chet. They're high-born, all but Blaine. They get drunk on words instead of wine. Lark sidled closer. Cheese for wits, 
Keeps going on about the bird, he warned, glancing about to make certain no one was close. Now he's asking if we cashed any seed for the damn thing. It's a raven, said Chet. It eats corpses. Lark grinned. Is, might be, or yours. It seemed to Chet that they needed the big man more than they needed Lark. Stop fretting about small Paul. You do your part, he'll do his. Twilight was creeping through the woods by the time he rid himself of the sister man and sat down to edge his sword. It was bloody hard work, with his gloves on, but he wasn't about to take them off. Cold as it was, any fool that touched steel with a bare hand was going to lose a patch of skin. The dogs whimpered when the sun went down. He gave them water and curses. Half a night more, and you can find your own feast. By then he could smell supper. Dywin was holding forth at the cook fire as Chet got his heel of hard bread and a bowl of bean and bacon soup from Hake the cook. The wood's too silent, the old forester was saying. No frogs near that river. No owls in the dark. I never heard no deader wood than this. Them teeth of yours sound pretty dead, said Hake. Dywin clacked his wooden teeth. No woods neither. There was before, but no more. Where did they go, you figure? Some place warm, said Chet. Of the dozen odd brothers who sat by the fire, four were his. He gave each one a hard, squinty look as he ate, to see if any showed signs of breaking. Dirk seemed calm enough, sitting silent and sharpening his blade the way he did every night, and sweet Donald Hill was all easy japes. He had white teeth and fat red lips and yellow locks that he wore in an artful tumble about his shoulders, and he came to be the bastard of some Lannister. Well, maybe he was at that. Chet had no use for pretty boys, nor for bastards neither, but Swede Donnell seemed like to hold his own. He was less certain about the forester the brothers called Saw Wood, more for his snoring than for anything to do with trees. Just now he looked so restless he might never snore again. And Maslin was worse. Chet could see sweat trickling down his face, despite the frigid wind. The beads of moisture sparkled in the firelight like so many little wet jewels. Maslin wasn't eating neither, only staring at his soup as if the smell of it was about to make him sick. I need to watch that one, Chet thought. Assemble! The shot came suddenly from a dozen throats, and quickly spread to every part of the hilltop camp. Men of the night's watch, assemble at the central fire! Frowning, Chet finished his soup and followed the rest. The old bear stood before the fire with Smallwood, Locke, Withers, and Blaine ranged behind him in a row. Mormont wore a cloak of thick black fur, and his raven perched upon his shoulder, preening its black feathers. This can't be good. Chet squeezed between Brown Banar and some Shadow Tower men. When everyone was gathered, save for the watchers in the woods and the guards on the ring wall, Mormont cleared his throat and spat. The spittle was frozen before it hit the ground. Brothers, he said, men of the night's watch. Men! his raven screamed. Men! Men! The wildlings are on the march, following the course of the milk water down out of the mountains. Thorin believes their van will be upon us ten days hence. Their most seasoned raiders will be with Harmer Dog's Head in that van. The rest will likely form a rear guard, or ride in close company with Mance Raider himself. Elsewhere their fighters will be spread thin along the line of march. They have oxen, mules, horses, but few enough. Most will be afoot, and ill-armed and untrained. Such weapons as they carry are more like to be stone and bone than steel. They are burdened with women, children, herds of sheep and goats, and all their worldly goods besides. In short, though they are numerous, they are vulnerable and they do not know that we are here. 
or so we must pray. They know, thought Chet. You bloody old pus bag, they know. Certain as sunrise. Corrin Halfan hasn't come back, has he? Nor Jarman Butwell. If any of them got caught, you know damn well the wildlings would have wrung a song or two out of them by now. Smallwood stepped forward. Munch's raid uh, means to b b break the wall and uh, bring red w war to the Seven k k Kingdoms. Well, that's a game to compare. On the morrow, we'll bring the war to, 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 to him. We ride at dawn with all our strength, the old bear said, as a murmur went through the assembly. We will ride north and loop around to the west. Harmer's van will be well past the fist by the time we turn. The foothills of the Frostfangs are full of narrow, winding valleys made for ambush. Their line of march will stretch for many miles. We shall fall on them in several places at once and make them swear we were three thousand, not three hundred. We'll hit hard and be away b before the horsemen can form up to defer to, to face us, Thorin Smallwood said. If they p pursue, we'll lead them a merry ch chase, then wheel and hit again further d d down the column. We'll burn their w wagons, scatter their herds, and slay as many as we can. Munch raid himself if we f f find him. If they break and return to their ho hovels, we've won. If not, we'll harrow them all the way to the w wall and see to it that they leave a tra 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 trail of corpses to mark their progress. There are thousands, someone called from behind Chet. We'll die! That was Maslin's voice, green with fear. Die! screamed Mormon's raven flapping its black wings. Die! 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 Many of us, the old bear said. Mayhaps even all of us. But as another Lord Commander said, a thousand years ago, that is why they dress us in black. Remember your words, brothers, for we are the swords in the darkness, the watchers on the walls. The fire that burns against the cold Sir Maldor Luck drew his long sword. The light that brings the dawn, others answered, and more swords were pulled from scabbards. Then all of them were drawing, and it was near three hundred upraised swords, and as many voices crying, The horn that wakes the sleepers, the shield that guards the realms of men. Chet had no choice but to join his voice to the others. The air was misty with their breath and firelight glinted off the steel. He was pleased to see Lark and Softfoot and sweet Donald Hill joining in, as if they were as big fools as the rest. That was good. No sense to draw attention when their R was so close. When the shouting died away, once more he heard the sound of the wind picking at the ring wall. The flames swirled and shivered, as if they too were cold and in the sudden quiet the old bear's raven cawed loudly and once again said, Die! Clever bird, thought Chet, as the officers dismissed them, warning everyone to get a good meal and a long rest tonight. Chet crawled under his furs near the dogs, his head full of things that could go wrong. What if that bloody oath gave one of his a change of heart? Or small Paul forgot and tried to kill Mormon during the second watch in place of the third. Or Maslin lost his courage, or someone turned informer, or... He found himself listening to the night. The wind did sound like a wailing child, and from time to time he could hear men's voices, or horses whinny, a log spitting in the fire, but nothing else. So quiet. He could see Bessa's face floating before him. It wasn't a knife. I wanted to put it in you. He wanted to tell her. I picked you flowers, wild roses, and tansy, 
and golden cups. It took me all morning. His heart was thumping like a drum. So loud, he feared it might wake the camp. Ice caked his beard all round his mouth. Where did that come from? But better. Whenever he'd thought of her before, it had only been to remember the way she looked, dying. What was wrong with him? He could hardly breathe. Had he gone to sleep? He got to his knees, and something wet and cold touched his nose. Chet looked up. Snow was falling. He could feel tears freezing to his cheeks. It isn't fair, he wanted to scream. Snow would ruin everything he'd worked for, all his careful plans. It was a heavy fall, thick white flakes coming down all about him. How would they find their food caches in the snow, or the game trail they meant to follow east? They won't need Darwin nor Bannon to hunt us down neither. Not if we're tracking through fresh snow. And snow hid the shape of the ground, especially by night. A horse could stumble over a root, break a leg on a stone. We're done, he realized. Done, before we began. We're lost. There'd be no lord's life for the leechman's son. No keep to call his own, no wives, no crowns. Only a wildling sword in his belly, and then an unmarked grave. The snow's taken it all from me. A bloody snow. Snow had ruined him once before. Snow and his pet pig. Chet got to his feet. His legs were stiff, and the falling snowflakes turned the distant torches to vague orange glows. He felt as though he were being attacked by a cloud of pale, cold bugs. They settled on his shoulders, on his head. They flew at his nose and his eyes. Cursing, he brushed them off. Samuel Tarley, he remembered. I can still deal with Sir Piggy. He wrapped his scarf around his face, pulled up his hood, and went striding through the camp to where the coward slept. The snow was falling so heavily that he got lost among the tents, but finally he spotted the snug little windbreak the fat boy had made for himself between a rock and the raven cages. Tarly was buried beneath a mound of black wool blankets and shaggy furs. The snow was drifting in to cover him. He looked like some kind of soft round mountain. Steel whispered on leather faint as hope as Chet eased his dagger from his sheath. One of the ravens quarked. Snow, murmured another, peering through the bars with black eyes. The first added a snow of its own. He edged past them, placing each foot carefully. He would clap his left hand down over the fat boy's mouth to muffle his cries, and then, oh! He stopped mid-step, swallowing his curse, as the sound of the horn shuddered through the camp, faint and far yet unmistakable. Not now. God's be damned, not now. The old bear had hidden far eyes in the ring of trees around the fist to give warning of any approach. Jarman buckles back from the giant stair, Chet figured, or Corin Halfhen from the skirling pass. A single blast of the horn meant brothers returning. If it was the half hand, John Snow might be with him, alive. Sam Tarley sat up puffy-eyed, and stared at the snow in confusion. The ravens were cawing noisily, and Chet could hear his dogs baying. Half the bloody camp's awake. His gloved fingers clenched round the dagger's hilt as he waited for the sound to die away. But no sooner had it gone than it came again, louder and longer. Oh! God! He heard Sam Tarly whimper. The fat boy lurched to his knees, his feet tangled in his cloak and blankets. He kicked them away and reached for a chain hauberk he'd hung on the rock nearby. 
As he slipped the huge tent of a garment down over his head and wriggled into it, he spied Chet standing there. Was it two? he asked. I dreamed I heard two blasts. No dream, said Chet. Two blasts to call the watch to arms. Two blasts for foes approaching. There's an axe out there with piggy writ on it, fat boy. Two blasts means wildlings. The fear on that big moon face made him want to laugh. Bugger them all to seven hells. Bloody armor, bloody man's raider. Bloody small wood, he said. They wouldn't be honest for another. Ooh. The sound went on and on and on until it seemed it would never die. The ravens were flapping and screaming, flying about their cages and banging off the bars. And all about the camp, the brothers of the Night's Watch were rising, donning their armor, buckling on sword belts, reaching for battle axes and bows. Samuel Tarley stood shaking, his face the same color as the snow that swirled down all around them. Three, he squeaked to Chet. That was three. I heard three. Oh, they never blow three. Not for hundreds and thousands of years. Three means... <laughs> Others. Chet made a sound that was half a laugh and half a sob. And suddenly his small clothes were wet, and he could feel the piss running down his leg, see steam rising off the front of his breeches. <laughs>